Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, hope you're having a good morning, good day, good night uh, from wherever you're joining. Uh, so my name is Yuval Degani, and uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about how we do Spark performance at LinkedIn scale uh, in our offline infrastructure. Um, so I'll try to be quick because I have a lot of things that I want to uh, share with you today. Um, I'll leave a few minutes at the end for Q&A, uh, so please uh, hold on uh, if you're waiting for that. All right. Um, can uh, everyone hear me okay? Can someone post in the chat just to be sure? Awesome. All right. So let me get started. Uh, so my name is Yuval. I'm part of the uh, LinkedIn's data infrastructure organization, uh, focused mostly, mostly on uh, scaling Spark and Hadoop in our uh, offline infra. Um, I have a pretty long history of performance work in the big data ecosystem in general. I used to work on uh, hardware accelerations using RDMA and different uh, networking technologies in the cloud and on-prem uh, to accelerate Spark and uh, edge DFS. Uh, in my uh, earlier uh, uh, experience, I used to work on kernel level and hardware accelerations uh, uh, on kind of a lower level side of things in drivers and so on. Um, so a little bit about LinkedIn. Uh, I suppose uh, a lot of you are familiar, but uh, the economic graph is basically our biggest product. Uh, you can think of it is what we call a di digital representation of the global economy. So our offline infra, uh, as well as our online infra, is uh, basically uh, allocated with the job of serving uh, 700 million members, uh, along with all of the jobs, companies, skills, and schools that are tracked within LinkedIn. Uh, so as, can you, as you can imagine, that is a massive amount of data that we need to deal with and also keep resource uh, utilization uh, efficient. Uh, a little bit about Spark at LinkedIn. So this is changing daily. Uh, I can say that the first time that I wrote this slide a couple of months back, uh, it was a little different, but these are the latest numbers. Uh, so we have north of 10,000 nodes uh, in our offline infra, about 30,000 daily Spark applications running. Um, and uh, shuffle data is pretty impressive. Uh, we're talking about 10 petabytes a day. And then uh, this is following growth of about 3x year over year in terms of uh, the daily Spark applications that we have. So uh, it's not optional for us to figure out how to scale performance uh, for Spark at LinkedIn. It is crucial for us to be able to keep up with the growth uh, that we're experiencing. Um, a little bit more about uh, Spark at LinkedIn. So we have about 3,000 internal Spark users. It's a pretty massive uh, amount of people that we need to support. And uh, this is where uh, it comes in, where we would want to provide self-serving uh, tools uh, for users to be able to you know, uh, debug and improve performance on their own and address inefficiencies in their jobs. Uh, we have a very diversified ecosystem for those Spark users. Uh, some of them are dealing with metrics, AI, machine learning models, um, and the traditional data science and data warehouse, uh, biz business intelligence, and so on. Um, so what is Project Optimum? Um, first of all, as most of you already know, scaling Spark is very hard. Um, and this is where we come in and try to uh, alleviate those problems and kind of make it easier for users to, uh, you know, make their jobs more efficient. So the motivation is uh, uh, three things that I can, you know, kind of think about is like a global idea that we need to consider. So first of all, uh, stability is a very important thing that we want to introduce into the system. Uh, we want to have a gatekeeper where uh, we could catch performance degradation and in intra and applications before they are actually deployed into production. Uh, and also, we would like to have early warning for uh, cluster performance issues and not have to wait until you know, a massive amount of jobs needs to run before we see problems popping up. 
for productivity, we would like to provide a quick and iterative uh, experimentation platform for validating code or config changes in applications uh, when users are developing or uh, trying to improve the performance of their existing applications. Um, so we would like to provide tooling to accelerate development of new infra performance features. So not only workflows, but also from the infra perspective, how do we uh, improve things and make sure that we are actually improving and not degrading? Uh, predictability, uh, we would want to surface the currently observed metrics and trends that are going on in the cluster right now so that application owners can then validate against that and better plan uh, to meet their SLAs of their uh, workflows. So in terms of the ecosystem that we're dealing here, uh, dealing with here, um, so we have the application side of things, which could be any kind of scheduled jobs or ad hoc jobs, experimentation, and so on, and what we call the golden flows, which we'll uh, uh, talk about later. Uh, all of those go uh, into our yarn clusters. Uh, so mostly running Hadoop and Spark jobs, a little bit of Hive and so on. And then uh, those are uh, basically emitting metrics, different types of metrics, uh, that we later use in order to analyze performance. Uh, so uh, think of it as uh, Yarn resource manager uh, metrics. We have HDFS client side metrics, Spark metrics, and also CPU profiling. All of those are persisted and provided to the analysis later uh, layer, where Gridbench data set comes in, and we'll talk about Gridbench later. This is kind of the main topic of this uh, session. Um, and those analysis tools enable us to create reports. So those could be ad hoc reports that we can uh, make portable and then uh, uh, share and persist and kind of document. Relate dashboards in real time so we can uh, figure out what's going on in the cluster across different types of jobs and different types of metrics that we care about. Um, and also reporting the variance in jobs across time so we can see if something is going uh, in a uh, not a very good direction in terms of uh, the, let's say, the delay that we're seeing or, uh, you know, any kind of other interference in metrics. Um, the other, the last thing is automation. So once we have all of those reports and analysis that enable us to come up with a A-B testing uh, platform so that you can experiment on different configs or different types of uh, different coding options and so on. Uh, and also alerting uh with the dashboards and all those uh, metrics being populated uh, we can set up alerts to catch these kind of issues uh, in a pretty early state so there are three pil pillars on how we address all those things uh, first of all there's the metric pipelines uh, then we'll talk about grid bench like i mentioned and the golden flows uh, let's start with the metric pipelines so where all those metrics are actually coming from right now so we have four main uh, producers of metrics that we consume in order to provide uh, performance analysis. So the first one is the Spark History Server, which I suppose most of you are uh, very familiar with. Uh, so the application metrics uh, through Spark History Server are exposed through REST API. And then those are basically available in real time or near real time, uh, depend on how long it takes to actually process the logs for a particular job. And it gives us a per job, per stage, uh, per task, and per executor metrics. The resource manager, uh, these are yarn metrics that are emitted to Kafka through Flume, and then provide us with an idea of the resource consumption per job, and then the scheduling delays. For HDFS, we have DFS client uh, metrics that are emitted to Kafka as well, directly from the executors. And those kind of expose the blocking times for IO and metadata ops. Uh, kind of completing the picture also into the storage domain. And then for profiling, uh, we have CPU flame graphs that are generated by each executor. Uh, this is kind of optional. It's up to the user if they want to configure their job to, pr to produce those. Uh, those are persisted to HDFS, and then uh, it could be accessed right after the job has finished running. So the first idea about the metrics uh, pipelines is for us to be able to liberate the data. So when I say liberate the data, we would want to make all of those metrics available for different types of analysis. So some of them could be the tooling that we're going to present today. But not only that, we have a pretty massive uh, uh, amount of people that are doing data science uh, that are developing platforms in kind of higher level about uh, above Spark and Hadoop and all those uh, kind of lower level platforms. 
uh, that they would want to also, uh, also consume those metrics and produce their own kind of performance analysis reports. So the first thing that we've done is to basically break down all of those sources and then make the data available uh, through two uh, phases. So the first would be uh, basically all of the metrics get emitted to Kafka and then they are available in real time. And uh, this way, real time and streaming consumers can then just uh, subscribe to those topics and process this data and let's say populate dashboards and so on in real time. Um, and then everything uh, gets persisted to Edge DFS so that batch and query uh, consumers can also start pr processing these jobs. And we can talk about that uh, in a few minutes. So uh, we have three pillars here uh, that we're creating. So basically we have Kafka for real time. Like I said, metrics are emitted in, uh, uh, to Kafka in minimal latency. And then uh, we have direct emissions from clients. Uh, we uh, stream the log files and so on, and that enables real-time dashboarding. But the caveat is that it has limited retention, uh, usually a few days back. On HDFS, this is where we have ETL pipelines to materialize the Kafka topics into HDFS. And then that kind of brings the latency from uh, uh, into minutes uh, to hours. We're working to minimize that, but it is part of the system that you know ETL pipelines usually takes uh, a, a few minutes at least to populate. Um, it registers all the data for uh, with Hive for SQL access, and that enables batch queries through Spark, Hive, um, and basically on-demand queries through Presto as well. Uh, the pro for this is that we have unlimited retain retention practically. Uh, we keep about three years of history uh, for all of those metrics. Um, another thing that this uh, uh, enables is for users to derive topics. So basically, uh, users can derive either in real time or in batches. Um, and uh, derivation in real time could be uh, something that runs over a SAMSA job that transforms one topic to another. Um, this is an example of how we do derivation of Kafka topic, even in this context. So um, the way that we populate the Spark metrics uh, uh, in this uh, in, in Project Optimum is uh, we have the yarn topic, which basically contains all of the resource manager completed application records, and those are emitted into Kafka. Now we have a SAMSA job that is basically the Spark tracking service. And what, what it does, it subscribes to the yarn topic and then every application that gets completed, uh, it will then go into the Spark history server and pull all of the metrics through a REST API and then construct a record pair uh, Spark application run and then emit that into Kafka again. So we basically have a kind of a transformation using SAMSA where we transform the yarn topic onto the Spark metrics topic. Uh, so this is a nice example of how derivation could work. So the next pillar that we want to talk about is uh, Gridbench. This is kind of the main tool that we're going to discuss today. So Gridbench is about self-servicing users and enabling them to provide, uh, to basically see different insights about their jobs and enable them to uh, improve and iterate and detect regressions and so on. So before we dive into Gridbench, let's talk a little bit about what are the existing tooling that exist out there. Uh, so Dr. Elephant is one example. Dr. Elephant was actually started at LinkedIn and we are uh, using it extensively, uh, but it has limited support for Spark. Uh, it only analyzes basic metrics to detect uh, skewness, memory and CPU utilization and inefficiencies and so on. Uh, it does not have a full access to the Spark metrics, and this is due to storage limitation uh, in how Dr. Elephant is designed. Another thing is that Dr. Elephant only supports a single application view where we would want to get to a point where we can uh, actually uh, see a history of different runs of the same workflow and kind of see how it behaves over time. Um, and another thing is a Spark history server that we've uh, already mentioned, um, the basic, the, the most significant caveat as we see for it is that it only supports a single application view. Not only that, uh, it has limited access to historical runs due to some scalability issues in level BD. Um, and then uh, there's uh, uh, another uh, entire aspect that is missing. Uh, so the Spark history server does not have a perspective on the resource consumption from, uh, uh, from Yarn. 
Uh, this is why we're missing some metrics from Yarn that we need to include here. So Spark History Server is just not enough. Um, another thing is that Spark History Server does not aggregate metrics across stages, and that makes it a little bit difficult to kind of figure out what is the overall metrics that we see for a particular application. So Gridbench is a holistic approach for Spark application performance. Uh, we would want to do a few things here. Uh, we would want to provide ad hoc analysis for Spark applications, basically produce reports that user can dive into and figure out what's going on in their job through different stages, through different metrics, and so on. And then uh, also allow aggregate analysis of multiple runs. So users can analyze their application behavior over time uh, you know, across uh, different times of the day, different types of input sizes, and so on. Um, we would want to allow comparisons of different sets of runs. So like a user can check what happened before and after a particular change. Uh, allow regression detection. And then uh, we would also want to, uh, the reports to be portable and persistent uh, so that uh, just to make it more flexible for users to, you know, uh, to make this work for their particular use case. Um, and also provide access to historical data um, in our context, usually this is three years. So uh, Gridbench allows two running modes, basically. And uh, this is uh, where flexibility is the main idea here. Uh, so Gridbench analysis logic is designed to be consumed from different environments. Uh, one option is the ad hoc calls uh, through the CLI. So we have a user-facing reporting tool and it's deployed automatically to pretty much every machine at LinkedIn, making it available for every Spark user. And then it generates portable uh, HTML reports with interactive controls so that user can actually dive in into specific, specific metrics. Uh, we'll see a demo for that uh, very soon. Um, there's also a text output option for whoever is trying to uh, you know, treat this output programmatically and kind of build alerts or any kind of logic on top of that. Um, so uh, batch and streaming, uh, this is the other uh, type of running mode that we allow. Uh, so basically, the logic for Gridbench is consumable through a Java artifact. Uh, you don't only have to uh, run the CLI itself. You can uh, basically depend on some of the artifacts that we built, some of the utilities, and produce the report uh, in place. For example, if you build a Spark job that analyzes a lot of application across time, then it's not something that you can do in a CLI because it's just too much data. Um, so for that, we can uh, uh, users can consume the Java artifact and uh, make those uh, transformations and analysis. Uh, same goes for streaming, and uh, that is used for uh, populating dashboards, creating reports, and uh, also triggering alerts. So where would we, where do we get the metrics for Gridbench? Um, so uh, there are several options here. Uh, the first one is from Spark History Server, and this was the original uh, 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 metric source that was only supported at Gridbench uh, in the early version. Uh, so like we've discussed, there's a REST API that is exposed and kind of uh, 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 exposes all of the metrics that Spark History Server collects. And then um, it lacks metrics from Yarn, HDFS, and so on, like we've discussed. So it's a kind of incomplete source. Um, Presto allows us uh, a little bit more complex filtering through SQL queries. So Spark History Server, you basically have to provide the application ID in order to search for applications. And that kind of makes it a little bit awkward if you're trying to analyze a particular job across time. You need to find another method on how to achieve, on how to basically retrieve those application IDs. And that uh, kind of uh, makes it more complex. Um, so uh, Presto gives us the more complex filtering with SQL queries, um, uh, it can read records that combine all of the metrics that we have some, from Spark History Server, from Yarn, and from HDFS, and also allow low latency ad hoc querying, which is what Presto is all about. Uh, for batch and streaming, uh, we have built-in support for Spark Data Frame API for feeding metrics into a grid bench and basically generating reports out of those uh, uh, data frames. Uh, this is used for some uh, batch and streaming jobs that are generating more uh, kind of uh, data sets that are derived from the grid bench metrics. 
Uh, the same could be to consume metrics from Kafka topics and then generate uh, a new topic with a grid bench output like we've discussed uh, for the Spark history server uh, uh, case. So um, not to get you guys uh, too bored, uh, let's see uh, a little bit of the reports that we have right now. So uh, Gridbench GUI is pretty new. So this is uh, very rough at this point. We're still working on it. Uh, but I want to show you guys around a little bit. Uh, I want to show some reports that we have and how we enable users to kind of self-serve and uh, diagnose whatever is going on with their jobs. So this is an example of a single application report. So let's say you have an application that just finished, and then Gridbench can produce this report for it. Uh, the most basic thing it provides is uh, kind of an overview acro across all of the stages and all of the jobs of all of the metrics uh, that we care about. These are kind of a minimized list of uh, important uh, metrics. Now, uh, you can uh, then filter by a particular job or filter by a particular stage and then see how the metrics kind of uh, 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 where time is spent within that particular uh, stage. Uh, we can see so, that for this stage, most of the time is spent in executor CPU time, which makes sense. Um, this is like the main uh, job thread. Um, another type of report that we have is what we call the diff report. Uh, think of it as uh, two reports presented side by side where you can compare two application runs. Uh, in this case, we can compare the global uh, metrics and see that uh, where are like the major differences uh, in the time that was spent. Uh, we see that there is major difference in GC time here, for example, and at IO time. Uh, so that kind of helps users understand, you know, uh, where most of the time or miss, where most of the inefficiencies are within their applications. Um, Another option here is to display by metric. Uh, for example, what we have here, it basically uh, lets the user see uh, what uh, uh, type of metric and what stage uh, is spent, uh, like where, where the metrics are spending time for each particular uh, metric. In this case, for the executor CPU time, we can see that for the matching stages 15 and 17, there's a bit of a difference between the two application runs. So the way that we do it is uh, we take the two applications and we analyze the DAG so that we can match jobs and stages uh, so we can actually compare on a per stage basis. Um, this kind of enables us to dive in deeper across different applications if they match in their DAGs. If they do not match, uh, it will not allow you to see uh, the per job or per stage analysis, only kind of the global. So let's browse, browse through uh, to the third type of report that we have. So it's a bit heavy. Um, OK, there it is. So this is the aggregate report. The aggregate report, it, usually, it basically takes a set of application IDs instead of just one. Let's say if someone is trying to analyze their application behavior across time, this gives you kind of an overview of uh, where, uh, uh, where are you at in terms of variance across uh, a particular metric. For, for example, for executor CPU time, we can see the mean is right here. And then this gives you kind of an overview on the quantiles. The last type of report and probably the most useful one and the most, uh, 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 I guess, uh, uh, the most important one of all of those uh, is what we call the performance regression report. So this type of report basically gives you, uh, it takes two sets of application runs. Consider it as before and after, let's say, that uh, you have a job that uh, started performing really bad at some point, and then uh, you would want to understand why. So you can choose two application sets before and after a particular date, and then compare uh, their statistical values uh, um, and try to understand what are the differences. So we can see that for application set one, uh, executor CPU time, we can see that the median is very far, and then uh, there's a, a, a very big difference in how the quantiles are uh, being distributed across the two application sets. So there's definitely something that's uh, different here between the two sets. Now, another thing that this uh, provides is uh, it does a regression analysis to tell you whether performance has regressed or had no change or it was improved. 
And then it also gives you the confidence level. So uh, you might see regression, but with very low confidence. But if it's high confidence, uh, you know, it usually means that uh, there is actual regression here. If there's low confidence, uh, it means that uh, the user should be uh, uh, going back and running uh, the application a, a, a few more times so that the data, data points will be more uh, kind of uh, 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 meaningful and have less outliers in them. So uh, let me go back to the slides um, and explain a little bit on how we do regression analysis. So regression detection um, is done here through statistical analysis tools. So uh, we have, uh, uh, we basically went through kind of an aggregate analysis research phase that we've done on various metrics that uh, basically revealed that all of them are normally distributed. That kind of drove us uh, into uh, some statistical methods that are designed in this, uh, for this particular uh, 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 case. So we collected test data to measure the effectiveness of several uh, statistical solutions that we've came up with. And then uh, we were able to see that uh, uh, there was real degradation in some of those that we were able to pick up with some of those options. Um, and then we found that t-test was uh, basically the most reliable way and the simpler way of detecting regression um, and basically detecting significant uh, statistical differences between uh, two samples. So how do we detect statistical differences? Uh, we use uh, Welch's t-test, which is a version of the student t-test that uh, uh, is designed for independent samples, basically unequal variances or uh, unequal sample sizes. So in this case, uh, given two sets of samples, uh, or I mean two sets of data points, or you can call them two samples. Um, and let's say if we set alpha to be uh, uh, 0 0.05, which means the 95 percentile, then if the Welch's t-test produces a value that is smaller than this alpha, it means that we have a statistically significant difference. So this is one uh, part of this. And then the next thing is how do we produce the uh, confidence level? Um, this is driven from the power of the hypothesis test. So basically we have the effect size. The effect size is a very common uh, coefficient that is built on top of Cohen's D. And then uh, those basically produce those uh, uh, categorizations that you see here. So basically, if the coefficient value is this, then the sample size is tiny. If the sample size is tiny, this translates directly into very low confidence, low, medium, high, and so on. And then if a user sees the confidence level um, as not high, it means that they need to go back, run the application a few more times, collect more data points so that the uh, stat statistical analysis model will be uh, more uh, uh, reliable. So how we uh, uh, compute Cohen's D. So Cohen's D is a pretty popular formula. Uh, it's not something that we invented here, but the idea here is to kind of understand uh, the differences in the standard deviations, what's called the pooled standard deviation. And then that kind of gives you an idea whether this sample set or those two sample sets are too far apart, if they're, uh, you know, what is their strength uh, or power in this case? All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is what we call the golden flows. So we've just mentioned that earlier, uh, but we haven't touched uh, through what this thing is actually uh, is. So the golden flows are a carefully curated set of jobs that represent uh, typical cluster workloads that we have at LinkedIn. Uh, there are, uh, most of them are cloned from real flows. Uh, uh, some of them are very high priority flows that we in particular care about uh, their SLAs. Um, some are artificially made to cover specific problematic areas that we uh, uh, have witnessed that are not covered as we want it to be uh, in the uh, real flows that we've created. Um, and all of those basically create a continuous series of metrics that allow real-time view of cluster health. So we have a small set of flows that represent 
uh, a vast majority of the population of flows that we have in the cluster. And that gives us a perspective on how things are going in the cluster. Uh, it gives us an early indication if uh, some platform is failing, uh, if there's like inavailability of some data, um, and it really helps in kind of uh, uh, early detection of problems before they become something that affect you know, the majority of the flows. So what is the golden flows? Uh, uh, and so this is basically a suite. The golden flow suite uh, is packaged as a deployable zip on top of Azkaban. So this zip basically contains all of the flow definitions, the jars, artifacts, uh, configs, and basically everything that's needed in order to emit those metrics uh, uh, into the common pipelines so that we can set up alerting dashboards and so on. Uh, the input data set path is configurable so that user can pin to a particular input uh, when they run those golden flows. So those golden flows actually depend on real data, so they have to have uh, 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 real input that they can consume. Um, there is validation steps along the way um, just to that just to uh, be able to detect if something is wrong. Let's say if the input data is not there <clears throat> or the input size is different than what we expect, this is something that we want to uh, uh, be able to surface before we report uh, results. So the Golden Flow Suite is uh, it, it can run on any of our clusters and then deployed over Azkaban and it runs over our Yarn clusters and consuming input data from HDFS and producing the same kind of metrics that we have for traditional Spark jobs. So we have several deployment options for Golden Flows. Uh, the permanent option is where we have a per cluster deployment, and this is where the input data is static. We do that in order to uh, reduce as much of uh, inconsistencies across different runs. If you run with uh, different input data uh, and compare the two runs, you might see something completely different just because of how the data, uh, just because of the data size or the content that might be different. So uh, this kind of serves as a gatekeeper. And uh, let's say when we deploy a new set of configs or a new versions of our platforms, then we promote those through the ranks through our different clusters. And that enable us to see what happens before we get into the production clusters. Uh, all those feed operational dashboards, alerts, and recurrent reports, like the stuff that we've discussed earlier. Um, so another uh, option for deployment is for experimentation. So users are able to deploy this zip, basically, uh, to uh, any of our existing clusters, and then customize to run on their particular code or in their particular version or configs that they're trying to test and kind of figure out um, what is what are the changes that they're doing and how they affect uh, runtime of golden flows? For example, if we're trying to change something in Spark, maybe a default config or maybe update the version, that gives us an idea on what will happen when we deploy this into production and how real jobs will behave. And that kind of enables us to iterate without causing any side effects. Um, and another one is the ephemeral option. So these, this is basically uh, uh, designed for temporary deployments. Let's say if you're trying to evaluate a new cluster, um, could be in the cloud. Let's say if you're trying to uh, evaluate different types of instances and see what is like the compute efficiency that you get from them. So you can deploy this uh, independent zip as long as you have the surrounding infrastructure like uh, Azkaban, Yarn, and all those stuff. And then uh, as long as you provide the input and make it available, then uh, you can uh, basically evaluate uh, new clusters and not have to uh, uh, abide to our existing clusters. So for the design choices that we've uh, uh, decided to go with, um, so in terms of curation, how, how do we get those flows? Uh, so the main idea here is to provide as much coverage as possible. We want to cover as many platforms as possible, configs, different times of the day or the week. And then critical and high priority jobs uh, are very important for us to get you know, very early indication of what's uh, going on with them. Um, the idea is to have flow or platform owners provide candidates and then monitor their health and maintain their versioning. Otherwise, it will not be uh, scalable for us as the performance team uh, to kind of maintain all of this. Um, 
So it depends on real flow executing or real data. And then uh, some of them are uh, custom designed like we've discussed. Uh, so the principles that we keep in mind is to keep customizations to a minimum. Uh, this complicates maintenance and kind of drift or, you know, from wherever the original flow is. Uh, we only put emphasis on consistency. So input data is pinned, like we discussed earlier. Uh, we disable dynamic allocation and disable uh, speculative ex execution because they create very much, uh, very uh, uh, difficult inconsistencies in the metrics. Uh, for managing side effects, uh, we require that the output is steered away from production paths, so we won't affect any kind of production data sets. And uh, that requires reviews by the flow owner uh, for us to uh, onboard new golden flows. So the insights that golden flows provide is, first of all, predictability. Uh, we can have a clear idea on what we should expect compared to the last day or the last two weeks, and then that enables us to kind of uh, uh, see trends that are going on in metrics uh, across different times, across different platforms for different types of flows, and then provide early detection of problems that are, uh, you know, starting to show up uh, even before we get into the production. And the last thing is uh, it allows us to compare the golden flow behavior on how it uh, aligns with the general population of flows. And if we see a diversion at some point, that kind of drives us into uh, reconfiguring the golden flow to better match what we see in the general population and vice versa. All right, uh, a quick case study. Um, so I'm gonna go over this quickly because we're, I, I wanna leave enough time for a Q and A. Um, so something interesting that we've seen in our cluster regarding shared resource interference. Uh, at one point, we saw a high priority production flow that showed uh, highly uh, variant end to end runtimes uh, and kind of misting SLAs. Uh, the grid bench metrics didn't show any significant differences uh, uh, that we were able to kind of highlight and figure out what's wrong. And then, digging deeper into each particular node, we were able to see that uh, there was a misconfigured C group uh, that created a resource leak between CPUs and kind of caused another job to uh, consume most of the compute resources for our job that we're interested in. Um, so we fixed the C group configurations and then that also prompted us uh, uh, to create an initiative to increase cluster predictability uh, by addressing the shared resource interference that goes for disk IO, shuffle system resources. And this is a new initiative that we're working on. So what's coming up next? Um, so we're uh, planning on open sourcing GridBench and making it available for the community. Um, uh, we're working on contributing our SHS changes back to Spark Upstream so everyone can enjoy uh, the necessary changes that we've made in order to uh, uh, collect the metrics that we're seeing in GridBench. Um, we're going to add straggler detection, highlighting bottlenecks, skewness detection heuristics, and integration with CPU profiling. Um, so, yeah, hold tight. This is all coming up. So I, we have a few more minutes. Um, sorry if I was going too quick uh, at the end, but I wanted to uh, uh, make sure I leave enough time for Q&A. So uh, yeah, um, let me read through the chat. Okay, so for Kafka nodes, uh, I'm uh, starting from the first question, uh, let me repeat that is, uh, could you give a rough estimate of how many Kafka nodes you need for every other service? Uh, so I, it's difficult for me to say, but I can say that, uh, uh, the, for example, the Spark tracking service that we have, um, it runs within a single Kafka node with a lot of other jobs running on it. Um, I'll try to follow up with a link to engineering blog that we have. Uh, maybe there is some more information about our Kafka infra, which I'm less familiar with. Um, okay, Kafka and Spark have their own data streaming API. Based on your experience, uh, I would ask which one is currently used at LinkedIn uh, for, I suppose this is uh, streaming data. Um, so, uh, we are uh, extensive users of Kafka. Pretty much uh, every type of metric, every type of uh, record that starts in our online world or our website 
and ends up uh, in our offline world passes through Kafka. And then it depends what happens in the way. Like if it ends up directly into HDFS using ETL pipelines, that's usually what happens for Kafka topics. And then uh, this is where Kafka topics can be transformed into data sets. But uh, we also use Samza in order to transform Kafka topics into other Kafka topics. Um, Spark streaming is less of a use uh, for us at LinkedIn as far as I uh, um, know at least. So it's definitely not a mainstream uh, method that we use. Okay. Um, for compute efficiency from the platform's perspective, uh, do you come up with uh, a mechanism to drive users to develop more efficient workloads? For example, Team B has low average performance score, hence can't deploy new jobs on production. Okay, this is a very good question. So uh, actually we uh, uh, have something like this in place as part of Dr. Elephant. So Dr. Elephant creates reports uh, following each job. And if you wanna nominate your job into the production clusters, it has to uh, comply with some of the requirements that we've set, that we've set in Dr. Elephant. Um, right now, there's no integration between uh, Dr. Elephant uh, performance analysis uh, and Gridbench, but this is definitely something that we're planning to do. And I expect that you know down the path, uh, we will enable something like this. So basically kind of uh, surface to the users that their job performance score is this and that, and they should address it and so on. But this is uh, currently just you know a thought at this point. All right, um, another question. Do you have any visibility on the performance on the ongoing Spark jobs to catch issues before SLA breaches? Okay, very very good uh, question. Um, so yeah, we do. We have the golden flows, which are running uh, pretty much, uh, uh, it, it depends on the type of the golden flow, but uh, most of them are running every hour or every two hours. So that gives us in com some kind of an early indication if something is about to go wrong. Um, uh, I suppose you were asking like, if we have any kind of indication for a particular job, if it's going to miss the SLA while it's already running. Uh, this isn't something that we have right now, but this is a very interesting thought, I must admit. Um, okay, what are you looking for forward to the most in the future of streaming as it's related to your work at LinkedIn? Um, okay. Uh, very cool question. I suppose, you know, what we've discussed so far is not designed for uh, streaming jobs at all. This is meant for batch jobs. And then uh, streaming jobs, it's a whole different story on how you can analyze them because metrics, you know, come on kind of a, a continuous basis. So you always have to keep, let's say, a window looking back and trying to understand what happened and where this is going in terms of trends. So it's definitely going to be very interesting to see how we can adapt uh, those uh, analysis to uh, streaming workloads, which are uh, you know very different from batch workloads that we can just compare complete runs instead of just windows of runs. So uh, yeah, this is not part of the uh, scope that we're dealing with right now. Uh, like I said, Spark streaming is not a major uh, 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 case uh, at the LinkedIn offline infra. Uh, but this is definitely a very interesting topic. All right. Um, so I see that there aren't any other questions. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I hope you enjoyed and that uh, you learned a few things and uh, there were at least a few takeaways. Um, uh, I'm uh, very happy to uh, have been given this opportunity to talk to you guys and uh, yeah, stay safe and thanks for joining.